Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Harvard Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. We're excited to have all of you here today. Uh, tonight's conversation with Reed Hoffman is going to be moderated by the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, David Elwood. And I'll let David take it from here and introduce Reed. Please join me in welcoming Dean Elwood. So let me extend my welcome also. I have to admit, I have done quite a few forums in my day, as many of you know. Um, I'm about as excited and nervous about this one as I have been in a quite a long time. Uh, so we, we are really, really, really very fortunate to have, uh, have Reed Hoffman with us here today. I do want to thank the Institute of Politics and the Harvard Decision Sciences Laboratory for all the work uh, that they did to make this all possible. So um, what can you say about someone who worked at Apple in the early years, founded an early online dating service, um, was part of the founding uh, directors of uh, PayPal, uh, co-founded and was chairman of LinkedIn, uh, was an early investor in Facebook, Cigna, Firefox, Air Airbnb, Groupon, and dozens of others, um, and a major supporter of Kiva and a dozen more of those. Um, what can you say? Well, I think the first thing you might say, he's rich, uh, <laughs> which is very good. You certainly would like to be uh, investing in whatever he's investing in. But what's really much more interesting about Reed Hoffman is he's, his wealth is in his ideas and his remarkable thirst and curiosity uh, on an enormous range of relations, his, his connections to people, uh, and of course, most of all, networks more broadly. Uh, he truly is a remarkable combination of talents, which makes him very good at picking these things or developing them or whatever else, but it's why we're it's so fortunate to have him here today. Um, it is perhaps no wonder that he has been called the startup whisperer, and, um, and indeed a headline in New York Times last November, I think I uh, got it pretty well also when they called him, the king of connections is tech's go-to guy. Uh, good headline. Um, he grew up in Berkeley, California, earned his bachelor's degree in symbolic systems, um, and, 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 uh... Just symbolic systems for the undergraduate degree. Oh, just for the undergraduate, I'm sorry, okay. Master's degree in philosophy from Oxford. Yeah, no, but there was symbolic <laughs> systems and something else, but I guess it was it's, it's whatever it is. Um, from Stanford, he graduated with distinction. He then got a Marshall Scholarship and went on to Oxford, where he got a degree in philosophy. So you could see, obviously, he was headed to being, uh, co-founding something. Um, <laughs> Uh, he uh, pursued a career in business and entrepreneurship. Uh, after working at Apple and Fujitsu, he co-founded his first company, socialnet.com, which was an online dating service which no longer exists, one of the very few such things that he's invested in, but learned a lot from that. Uh, but while he was doing that, he became one of the founding directors at PayPal and joined the, became the executive, direct, executive vice president and did everything from payments infrastructure to business development and external relationships, government and legal and so forth. Then in 2003, he co-founded LinkedIn, which is the world's largest professional networking service. For those of you that are not members, uh, they, uh, there are 150 million members in 200 countries and territories around the world. And uh, since there are probably no more than a billion um, working people at all, that means that 15% of all working people are on this. So if you're not on it, man, we are <laughs> out of it. Um, he's, uh, he's, for the first four years, he was chief executive officer, and he's currently executive chairman. In 2009, he, gro he joined Greylock as a partner, where his primary focus has been on world-class entrepreneurs, uh, and new categories of ideas. He is the recipient of the SD Forum Visionary Award. He's also been a Henry Crown Fellow by the Aspen Institute. And 2011, he was named uh, an Endeavor Entrepreneur of the Year. You'd think this was enough. You'd think he's probably very busy doing all these things and so forth. But he decides instead, uh, he also has some things to say about all of us. And he wrote a uh, book called The Startup of You, which we're certainly going to talk about. And of course, it's been a New, a New York Times number one bestseller. Um, so it is rather intimidating to be with tonight's guest, Mr. Reed Hoffman. Uh, but uh, so first, welcome, help, join me in welcoming Reed to, for being here. Thank you. We have this normal trick of set the expectations low. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it's your bloody fault. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, 
So I wanted to start, what we're gonna, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to do uh, some, ask, read some questions, we'll have a conversation among each other, and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions and comments and the like. And um, if you have not read the book or haven't seen the book, uh, my, I, I've got to tell you honestly, going in uh, when I was looking at this book, I thought this is like not a good use of Reed's time. Um, generally speaking, when you read books by famous people, and they are all about, you know, all the great things I've done in my life, and these, you should be just like me kind of thing and so forth, you come away thinking, um, no, I couldn't be just like that person. Whatever. This book is incredibly helpful and really thought-provoking and really pushes the bound and forces you to rethink several different sorts of things. We'll come to that in a moment. But one of the lines he has early on is, he said, um, he, was, he originally thought he, he would be a scholar. Uh, that's because he had so many interesting ideas and so forth. Uh, but then he said, eh, I, wasn't, I just wasn't uh, real enough, connect enough. So he said, then I'm going to go into business, but what's my comparative advantage going to be? It's a big theme of the book. What is your comparative advantage? And he sort of said, well, I know. I'm good at you know, complexity and abstraction. So that's what I'll be good at. But in fact, you then go on to say, read that, um, your real advantage was the ability to think simultaneously about individual psychology and social dynamics on a massive scale. Hmm. Now, that's a really cool sentence, but what does it mean? <laughs> uh, clearly, the writing could be a little better. No, no, it's great. <laughs> um, well, so just to elaborate a little bit, the, when I first went from academics, I thought, well, I've been good at academics. Part of what academics are good at is, is mastering abstractions. Yeah. Uh, this mastery of abstraction is one of the things that will make will have my comparative advantage within the business world. I learned within about a year or two that that was a dumb idea, right? Because in the business world, you want the simplest possible strategy and idea that actually gives you traction, as opposed to managing complexity. And so you, your, your, your actual, all the hard work goes into actually, in fact, trying to make your, the plan of execution, the target, the product, as simple as possible. And so I was like, okay, that was, that was dumb. But, what I learned along that process was that the combination of doing symbolic systems, which probably you were thinking it was cognitive science and so forth, which is in, yeah, within symbolic systems, science, yeah. um, uh, and philosophy was thinking about both how individuals think and how they operate, and also thinking about how ecosystems operate. And when you're building consumer internet properties, either as an entrepreneur or as an investor, you have to think simultaneously on both these levels. Because you have to think about what are the incentives, how are people going to use this product, uh, what are the positive and negative incentives, and then you also have to think about what happens when you have hundreds of millions of people using them. And this affects all kinds of different ways. So for example, in PayPal, it isn't just you know, like all the, the regular people, it's also all the criminals. Like one of the things that we realized when we got to hundreds of millions of people, one of the conversations that I had with Peter about this, was we were trying to figure out what percentage of murderers were actually using PayPal. Because it just, when you're scaled hundreds of millions of people, you have everybody in the system. And so what does this mean as a function of designing the ecosystem? And so you both need to design it on the individual basis, and you need to design it so that when you get to millions, tens of millions, and hundreds of millions, that the product maintains its consistency in terms of how it's operating. And uh, this simultaneous design, together with a function of, well, how do you grow from the first couple of users into this? The, uh, you know, various techniques that you add into this. Like, for example, when you put in a game dynamic, uh, to give you an early example from LinkedIn, we wanted to have a game dynamic that would cause people to say, well, I want to be, I want to show myself as more connected. So we put in this, this little counter saying how many connections you have. And the positive part of the game dynamic is this helped the people who wanted to play this game. This helped the early connection density within LinkedIn. This is the individual psychology. But then it kind of went haywire because some people wanted to play this game so badly that they were going to 30,000 connections, which nobody knows 30,000 people. It's impossible, <laughs> right, as a function. So when we were tuning it, we went back to, we now set the, what is currently the 500 plus. So these are the kinds of things about going both kind of at an individual level and at a social level and simultaneously building the product on both levels as a function of knowing like, you know, will this product work? Will Airbnb work? You know, will Facebook work? Will Zynga work? It's, you have to look at both levels when you're doing it, and then both levels when you're building it up. Mm, that's really interesting. So um, in, your, in your life, um, networks have always been a big part of it. 
How did you translate that into LinkedIn? Why, do, and of course, social networks were mm. around already. What, what made LinkedIn different? What, what brought you that idea? Well, the, one of the things that's kind of has an intellectual substrate to LinkedIn was paying a lot of attention to why is it Silicon Valley is uh, such an awesome place for innovation. And what I noticed was what was happening in terms of the, the formation of ideas and the very quick iteration was that people just didn't confine themselves to silos and talking. So you would see a person from Yahoo in their small business division sitting down with a person from eBay and talking about how do, small business, how do you find small business online, what, uh, what products they like, what is going on in the general sphere and so forth. And this sort of ideation was part of what makes Silicon Valley such a powerhouse of innovation. Because what happens is the fragments of information, ideas, not inside, not, not confidential information, but kind of tools and techniques and ways of thinking about it, um, kind of the, the pieces come together at much faster gravity, get chunked into interesting strategies, and then spread throughout the network. And when I was looking at this, I basically went, all right, I actually think that this pattern of work is how the pattern of work is going to go everywhere in the world. And what are the kinds of tools and platforms that are going to be important for this to happen? And that's part of, that was kind of one of the pillars by which LinkedIn was intellectually constructed. Because what I was noticing was a combination of where, how is the world of work evolving, right? Which is no longer the, you know, I graduate when I'm 22, I go to IBM or P&G, and I, I'm done when I'm 65. But actually, in fact, the industries are changing a whole lot more. And people have a responsibility for kind of a different career path. And um, that technology enables it. So now you have the internet where everyone can have a professional brand online, everyone can bring their network present to ask questions in ways that were much easier than before when all you had was a Rolodex and a telephone. And so those two things together, together with kind of looking at what is the future of work for Silicon Valley were the, were the, were the kind of the, the foundations of the network idea. And so are you, in a recent TED uh, talk that you gave a month or two back, you talked about how we're moving from the information age to the network age. What do you mean by that? Well, so, you know, th and there's also this interesting question is every age, I think, thinks they're the information age because every age thinks they have new information. <laughs> so demarcating the information age is interesting. But the key thing was if you actually look at the changes that the Internet is bringing, which this is kind of obvious, it's ex explosive exponentiation of information. So the question is, how do we navigate that? How do we make sense of it? How do we come to judgments of truth? How do we come to judgments of action? How do we make certain things happen? And the answer is, I think that now all the information is actually being much more uh, centrally framed within networks. And so, for example, uh, networks of reputation, networks of, of attention and information access, you, know, you can look at this as like who you're following, who you're connected to as a, as a version. And this trend was actually one of the things that um, informed my early investing decisions because I basically thought that what was going to happen is all of our real world networks, all of our identities and our actual real relationships are going to get translated to online in a way that that now becomes a platform that new kinds of applications about how we navigate the world was going to play out. And I think this is an ongoing trend that when you think about how do you solve various kinds of problems. So I, for example, and I suspect the conversation will get into this, but you know, what does the modern university look like? What should governments be doing? How should corporations be doing innovation? How should individuals be managing their careers? The question of what's the network way, uh, thinking way of doing that is I now think is a very central question to, to looking at um, you know, how do you amplify and supercharge. And I'll add one more thing before we get to the next part of this, which is part of when people ask me, how do you build all their Silicon Valleys? And the really key thing is creating network density. Because it's the network density of people being able to find each other with the right information, and expertise, resources in a fast-moving clock that is the thing that creates the amplifier for entrepreneurship. <clears throat> but how, I mean, uh, you were kind enough to host uh, Jen Lerner and a group of us for dinner at one, uh, one point in, in uh, Palo Alto. And it was, again, this one-on-one, -on -one I mean, multiple people, incredibly intense intellectual discussion about ideas, about how you take it to, to, to use it and so forth. But there's a lot of that human interaction piece there. Mm. How, far are, how far along are we on the, making the virtual version of that as powerful as the Silicon Valley piece that, that inspired you? I think we're just in the beginning steps. And part of it is people understanding what being network intelligent actually means as acting as an individual. So 
And this is one of some of the things we the longest chapter in the book is a book on networks because people frequently misunderstand and go, oh, networking is kind of icky, right? You know, like someone walking up to you, you don't know, saying, hi, my name's Reed, nice to meet you. And you're like, oh. Um, and actually, in fact, uh, part of being network intelligent is you have a group of people that you are, have trust relationships with, alliances. There's ways that you build alliances by knowing people over time, by helping each other solve various problems. And that part of that is then being graceful through that network. Um, so for example, you know, one of the things that was kind of uh, critical to the theory of the early building of, of, of LinkedIn was one of the ways that you help people in your network is with introductions. And that one of the ways that you show that you are helping them is say, oh, actually talking to so-and-so who really knows about this project that you're trying to solve could be really useful to you. And part of what LinkedIn then does is it makes it much more easy and transparent. So when you're thinking about, well, I'm trying to figure out, for example, how does you know, all the Silicon Valley industry apply to the next generation of government, you can go do a search on LinkedIn. You can find out who I might know who might be useful and say, oh, is talking to Mitchell Baker, who's the chairperson of Mozilla, is, would you, oh, she'd be great. Oh, let me, can I have an introduction? Let me talk to her. And that sort of thing is much more human. Now, I think literally these tools are just beginning because it requires the conceptual shift for people to think about how am I network intelligent in the way that I act, the way that I behave. And, and you've talked now about network literacy. Mm -hmm. What do yep. you mean by that? Well, so one of the things, this is part of the TED Talk, was I said, uh, the literacy is like a notion of a basic skill. It's like language. Uh, about a decade ago, John Battelle coined search literacy for folks who could use search in order to find the right information would have an edge, a comparative advantage. Now I actually think the folks who are, when they're solving projects, they think, how do I deploy my network or how do I deploy network thinking in order to solve this project a lot better? So for example, one of the things that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs all do, all the successful Silicon Valley entrepreneurs do, is they don't say, oh, I have my idea. Well, maybe not all. There's, there's jobs who we can get to. But the vast majority go, if you're smart, <laughs> right, I'm going to talk to you about it. Because getting information back allows me to navigate in a much better way. And that's a, that's a function of, of, um, of uh, kind of how you deploy networks in order to be intelligent. So and it is really a way in which you, you again, it's, it's reproducing your Silicon Valley in a different s scale and so forth. OK, well, let's go to the book. Um, and because, uh, and let me uh, riskily sum up a couple of things that I took from the book at least. The, ba the basic idea is the way you do a startup is a lot the way you should do your own life. You should do your own, uh, you should live your life. And that means that you're, um, you know, you kind of aim in the right direction, but don't pretend you know exactly where you're headed. Uh, you be prepared to adjust and pivot as new opportunities become available or, or risks emerge that you weren't seeing before. Be exceptionally curious um, and uh, collecting insights from everywhere, and, but particularly create and nurture your networks because they are really your source of information, not only information, but, but uh, help you think through where you're headed and so on. So, um, you know, but, you know, it still seems a little weird, right? You know, <laughs> entrepreneurs are supposed to create companies, not lives. So what yeah. does that, help me understand what you mean. Well, the key thing, and this, is, this, this was one of the things we wrestled with at the very early part of this project, my co-author Ben and I. And the natural thing is people don't think, oh, entrepreneurs, they're, they're lone mad people who kind of run, run, run in the de desert and take risks. They're individuals. They, they don't work at companies. They kind of can't work for people. They have to go do things themselves. Would this metaphor cause the wrong kind of, kind of uh, understanding of it? And the reason why we resolved to stay with it was that one of the really key questions that entrepreneurs uh, solve is, how do you adapt to and invent the future? And if you think that globalization is bringing changes, that technology is transforming industries, and that the pace of these changes is, if anything, increasing, right? It's not even staying at its current rate, but it's likely increasing then that the, the, the essential nature of being able to both kind of shape the future and adapt to it is critical. And that's exactly what entrepreneurs do. Because what they do is they figure out to say, okay, where is the kind of the market heading? Um, if you think of yourself as a product, how do I get to product market fit? Uh, what are the ways that I can take certain risks that other people don't see in order to create a competitive advantage? Uh, what are the things that I can do in order to uh, essentially always be, the phrase we use in the book is permanent beta, is I'm, I'm never a finished product. I'm always learning, I'm always adapting. And those are the skills that entrepreneurs have done with companies. And so we thought as a model, 
as opposed to thinking about kind of career ladders, which I, like I pick up a certain number of skills, I discover what my passion is about, and then I kind of just go up a kind of a, a ladder, I actually think of myself as a sort of a, as the entrepreneur of my own life, and I'm constantly kind of going, okay, what do I need to learn? What else, what else do I not know? And how should I be evolving, even if my entire career is at one company? And that was the reason why we thought the metaphor would be important. One of the more provocative things you talk about is, well, back up, every graduation speech just about that I've ever heard, the person basically says, um, figure out who you are, follow your dream, you know, go for it and make a difference. And I would say that's not exactly your message. Is that fair? Uh, that is fair. I mean, we think that uh, what you're passionate about is one important ingredient. But one of the things that we think is wrong in a highly changing world is that you actually also have to read the market. You have to have a sense of, like, what's the market I'm going into? What is my competitive differentiation? What are competitors doing? Like, one of the things that we included in the book that struck both Ben and I is we saw this um, billboard in, on, along Highway 101 in Silicon Valley. It said, you know, a million people can do your job. What makes you so special? Right? And that's the kind of thing to think about in terms of globalization, about, like, okay, how is it you could create this kind of competitive advantage? And, uh, and part of the thing is, when you think about it, is yes, your passion and what you're driving to, what your natural proclivities, that's an important variable in the equation. But it's radically incomplete. And just like entrepreneurs, have, they can't just say, oh, I've got an idea for a product. It's, it's, a, it's a fizzy cola, and I think I'm just going to do it. It's like, well, there's a few of those out there already. How is that going to work? That's the same thing in terms of how you think about yourself. So it's, it, the, the discovery of the passion is important, but radically insufficient. And it, but also, you, you emphasize, and it's clearly true, that we are all changed by our own experiences. Yep. And so what we, what we were passionate about didn't work, doesn't matter, whatever, you see something else that does. Yeah, the, the, the mantra that we put throughout the book was the world's changing, the competition changing, and you're changing. And so all of your techniques, plans, and strategies should incorporate that those three variables are always changing. And, and here's the techniques of how to keep this kind of flexible planning as you're going. Now, one of the things I emphasized in my introduction of you, and I, I, I we talked earlier, and it's one of the areas where I wish the book was even stronger, was this intense curiosity uh, that you have and that I think is partly your, uh, what makes, what, what makes uh, you kind of unique. Um, is that something that, I mean, again, most people, they, they're done with school. They're not so sure they want to learn so much. Uh, for them, networks are not a source of information. They're a source of friendship. Um, how do you train people to be constantly open and curious and... Well, I think how do you that, think about that? I think at least curiosity is somewhat like uh, muscles, right? So you have to exercise it, but I think with exercise, you can get better. And I actually learned uh, kind of a technique that I use constantly from one of my tutors, a guy named Bill Child, who's a philosophy tutor at Oxford. And when I sat down with him, I thought we were going to have dinner, and I was going to ask him all these questions about philosophy, because I was trying to think about, like, should I become a professional philosopher? And actually, about 70% of the time, he was asking me questions. Right, because he goes around the world with you know, kind of his life with a set of things that he's thinking about. And when he sits down with somebody, he goes, oh, you probably know about this. This is probably something you know about. And he starts asking questions. And one of the right ways to engage in your network, whenever you're sitting down with someone that you're getting to know, someone that you, even someone that you know, is like, oh, what are things that uh, I might learn? What are questions I might ask as a portion of that? And if you actually use that as a kind of ongoing discipline, I think curiosity is something that can be learned. It's not purely ornate, and it's a skill that you can get better at, because if you're talking to someone and you ask, you ask them a question about something that's important to them, something you want to learn about, it's a great starter for an interesting conversation where you can possibly encounter serendipity. So for example, I might ask you know, uh, Dean Elwood about his perceptions about what's going on on the internet, because even though you know, his uh, expertise and focus is government and a bunch of other things, Actually, that may be a useful intersection where suddenly we can have a serendipitous conversation where there's a discovery that's really valuable. All right, and you, of course, are the king of networks. And you have a <laughs> lot in there about how you really become and use networks. And again, there are some things that I wouldn't necessarily have, have, have thought about. Well, so the key thing is to always think about it as being genuine. One of the reasons why networking generally has a kind of a sleazy feel to it is the way that people frequently talk about it is, is how do you get that person in your Rolodex? How can they be a useful asset to you? And you're like, oh, that, that sounds like not the way I want to be interfacing with people. And if you actually think about it is, how do we do this? How is it alliance? How is it kind of like, how is it a dance that we do together? How is it is a way that we help each other as a function of how the mental framework? 
And so the book and the chapter on networking, which is the, the kind of middle chapter, and it's the section that we go into LinkedIn the most on. We, I try to actually uh, only include LinkedIn where it's, it's deeply relevant, otherwise leave it out to kind of a general entrepreneurial mindset. But it's a section where you start thinking about like, okay, what are the ways that you build genuine relationships? And how is it that in doing that, you actually have a network of people around you who are your allies in how you navigate this modern world? And so, okay, um, we're in the education business here and so forth. So what does this mean for education? Um, well, so I think one of the things is um, that teaching the kind of flex, uh, flexible adaptability through networks is actually, I think, really, really important. I think the notion of uh, actually trying new things, uh, obviously one of the things that classically education has been around is like, okay, this is what you learn, then you learn, then you test as a way of learning and so forth. But how do you include more kind of varied elements in it? So for example, like one of the key things, if you think the world's changing at a faster rate, you know, events like this one are particularly great because you said, like, let's bring in perspectives from outside the university and embed them in the learning process. And I think this can be done, these, I think these events are great, one of the reasons I was honored to be here. But I think also, like, how do you build that actually into coursework? How do you build that into uh, projects? How do you build that into um, ways that people bring not just the network within the university, but the network around the university for uh, forming connections, intelligence, uh, uh, taking risks, uh, trying things, these sorts of things, I think would be the kind of natural prescriptions that would come out of kind of network thinking and entrepreneurial thinking in universities. Can you think of any examples where you know, the, uh, traditional classrooms at a Stanford or whatever else mm -hmm. really help people learn about using networks in the way you, you described it, not just how to get connected, but to how to really have these highly, high quality, trusting, um, interactive, mutually beneficial networks? Well, one of the things that I did back at Stanford, um, and it's not quite the classroom, but I founded a program called the Small Systems Forum because what I was trying to do in an inter interdisciplinary major was take the fact that we were doing computer science, psychology, philosophy, linguistics, uh, logic, and math, and put them into a place where we were bringing in industry pr practitioners every week, where we would have it themed based on the kind of classwork that we were doing, and we'd have an interaction with what they were doing relative to the stuff we were doing in our classwork. And that was an effort very early in you know, kind of what the stuff I was doing to try to meld these two together because uh, we could then, the students could then be going, oh, that's how the natural language process is actually being used in these people trying to build products. I understand it's not just the kind of a formalism I'm playing games with or learning a kind of a skill with, but I can see the ties between it. And also, by the way, frequently you'd find, oh, there's a lot more, you know, this one class is not enough. I need to learn a lot more in order to get there. But um, uh, I think those kinds of things. I also think that the notion of um, I think that it's supposed to kind of, I think the ivory tower from freedom of thought, freedom of expression is extremely important, but I think the ivory tower from a question of uh, knowing what the OS and how the modern society is running needs far more interconnection uh, than it does. And so those would be areas that I would kind of shine a spotlight. Okay, I'm going to last, one last question, then we're going to have, we'll allow you to create questions and we'll be taking them from these uh, microphones and you know, scattered around the audience. But that, you know, <laughs> technology has really uh, created unbelievable turmoil and excitement and, and uh, new builds, you know, creative destruction really throughout most industries, increasingly mm -hmm. now and even in the nonprofit or civil society. But it's, it's really had remarkably little impact on basic government and mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. Well, you know, do some e-delivery stuff. It's easier to mm -hmm. renew your driver's license. Mm -hmm. Some places you can figure out where the bus is. But in terms of the basic functioning, the deliberation, <laughs> think about health reform, think whatever else. I think most people look and say, man, it's not, not getting better, maybe it's getting worse. Um, <laughs> how, how do I apply these same insights, which clearly are powerful, clearly are about deliberation as much as they are about, yep. uh, and yet they haven't happened. So why isn't it happening, and how do we think about getting to a different place? Well, let's see. Um, so three, three fragments of answers. One fragment is, generally speaking, when we're looking at plans that we invested in Silicon Valley, we tend to try to run around existing institutions rather than go through them. Because again, creating that change within the existing institution almost always bogs you down in trench warfare. The problem is you can't really run around government. The government is actually the thing that makes it happen. So you have to actually go through and actually uh, help institution and organizational change, which is almost always slower. 
Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't probably some things to do. So the second part of it is, well, what are the ways that you can apply the techniques? Um, so for example, you know, can you create um, uh, kind of like, sorry, for example, reputational networks and other kinds of things for ideation about what kind of, ide what kind of discussion that's going on in the political discourse? Uh, create, one of the things that's interesting, uh, internet properties almost always create their own brands. I mean, if you actually think about it, like think about what the brand of Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn is, and yet not a dime was spent on marketing the brands, which is kind of classically how brands are spent. Well, can you create brands of trust in kind of similar kinds of ways that can affect the public discourse? And maybe that's a way to kind of approach it without having to completely go through the kind of the center of changing the deliberation process. Obviously, questions of transparency. Um, I mean, like for example, what kinds of things could you create that if you use kind of uh, Wikipedia as a model on certain kinds of bills and public discourse might be potentially interesting. And the classic thing, and this is the kind of the last part of entrepreneurial part of this, is to try a number of them with a process by which you go, like one of the things I've kind of learned to think about any project in from Silicon Valley was one or more founders, a plan, and resources. And you have to have a good answer in each of these to how that plan will go through the current market, have a competitive edge, and will likely have a path that they can kind of iterate and pivot as they're going down. And that's, you know, like getting a number of those projects going in the space would, would, well, it's already happening, but to amplify that even more. All right, so I want to open that up to the audience. We have microphones in four places, one right here, another one up there, one there and there, and I'm just going to go uh, in, uh, in clock, clockwise here. Just a couple of reminders about what a good question is at the Kennedy School. It starts uh, with you identifying yourself. Uh, second of all, it is short and contains just one uh, idea. And finally, it ends with a question mark. Uh, and I'm kind of strict on all three of those rules. So why don't we start right here? Uh, my name's Chris. Um, if this is the information age, is our information sufficiently secure from theft and, Ill and illicit use? Uh, well, I was saying it was moving to the network age, but um, the critical thing when people think about data, everything from privacy, security, and everything else, is not all data is created equal. And so what you actually have to do is which pieces of data are particularly important for uh, privacy, for security, et cetera. And obviously, uh, there is, I mean, we're evolving into the future so fast that, you know, kind of uh, cyber terrorism and cyber warfare threats are serious. Uh, what's going on with some commercial entities? I mean, obviously, there's lots of, of um, uh, problems with spam and other kinds of things that are also happening. Um, and so, you have to, given the, the speed is accelerating, you have to respond to it. And I think there are challenges there, but I'm ultimately optimistic that it'll be sorted out the right way. So, what a, what a secondary question. Yeah, thanks. Just sorry, one per customer. Right up here. Uh, hello, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Sam Panato, I'm an undergraduate at the college. Um, and my question is related to um, design thinking and how it relates to um, this entrepreneurial mindset that you're yep. espousing. Um, so like if you think about like the process behind a company like Idea or Continuum, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see the relationship between sort of like the design thinking process and the, um, the self-improvement entrepreneur, self entrepreneurial process? Yep. How do those two relate in your mind and, and in the context of your book, of course? Yeah, so, um, so design thinking is a process by which you uh, take in multiple considerations and iterations in order to get to a, uh, a good shaped product, service, et cetera. And so I actually think they're naturally synergistic because I think the question of learning these tools about thinking about how do you bubble from constraints into, um, into essentially figuring out like this is what the design of this should be is part of that flexible iteration process. When you have like, for example, in the, in the book I go through plans A, B, and Z, you can apply them to each one of them. So it's actually, I think, natural synergies. I don't think it's actually at all in conflict. Uh, no, but do you feel like, um, oh. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'll try to answer more fully. <laughs> well, I, I'm. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jacob Morello, and I'm a freshman here at the college. And um, I'm asking this question on behalf of the forum student committee here at the IOP. Um, so in 20 years from now, um, obviously, mm -hmm. social media is huge right now, and it's only going to continue to c grow us closer and closer together. What do you feel is the balance between privacy and connectedness? Um, it seems like currently that there are some questions about privacy with the amount of information that we willingly post online. Thank you. 
So I think it's a very complicated question. I think one of the challenges when people normally think about privacy is they don't realize that it's a moving bar and it depends a lot on how people frame it. So if you frame it as someone who's like, oh, this entity, government, corporation, et cetera, is going to use your information and you know nothing about it, that naturally brings alarm. When you say, oh, actually, there's a bunch of data that's being generated that's providing the service that you're really liking, it's like, oh, that's okay. And as an instance, in 2000, uh, DoubleClick uh, ran into a lot of trouble with their acquisition of a company called Abacus, which was tracking some elementary information about users in order to target web advertising. Whereas that's now standard to what everyone's doing. And actually, most people are okay with it because they're like, look, if there's a chance that I see advertising that's more relevant to me, that's good for me. So the key things to think about, this is a little bit of the answer to the earlier question of not all information is created equal. So for example, what movies are like I like, that by and large is pretty safe and there is no way it can be ambushed. Whereas location information is much more careful and you have to be much more careful about that. And so what I think is happening is, you know, we're going through this very fast cycle by which we're trying to figure out which pieces of information actually lead to better tools, better services, better navigation in a world that I'm much more likely to, to, to love and to be it, and which ones are very dangerous. And for example, I mean, take the central kind of photo tagging you know, kind of experiences. On one hand, if you had described that before the system was exist, existing, everyone would have been a little freaked, freaked out about it. Whereas, in fact, actually, a lot of people now really like it, because they're like, oh, it creates a social fabric by which I'm discovering things with my friends, and people begin to learn the rules of, oh, I put these kind of pictures up. I put up pictures of us at an event or a party and these kinds of things. Now, it's not to say there aren't problems, but, you know, uh, when, you know, a huge percentage of people are actually using it and liking it, then that ends up working out well. And you have to track that the, the, it's not one solid line, that the line is actually moving as we all discover what works for us and what doesn't work for us. I love the story recently that said spring break in Florida is much less fun, much less uh, dramatic and, uh, shall we say, revelatory uh, <laughs> than it used to be in the past because everybody knows you're going to be in photograph. Yes. Right here. Thank goodness for some things. I have kids. <laughs> uh, Reed, we were together at the MacArthur Digital Conference. Yep. Uh, Mark told me he's out. So the question is, if we cut to the chase and we pretend like it's however many years from now and the Wizard of Oz moment has, mm. we've gone from black and, uh, black and white now to color, mm. it sounds like you're building or you aspire to build a problem-solving platform mm. that where people could instantly be plugged in into meaningful ways. What would that be worth if you're guessing the value of that? And should that be owned publicly by everyone or should it be owned by one company? So I think there'll be multiple platforms. I think that depending on which problems the platforms each are solving will depend on valuation. And given I'm a chairman of a public company, I can't do anything that looks like speculation of values because people may misconstrue it. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's one of those funny things. Um, and, uh, but I do think that one of the things that's central is, is thinking about networks as ways that they solve problems and that the key thing, not just at LinkedIn, but also in the book, is I'm trying to encourage people to think about how do I network solve this problem? You, you encounter a problem, you say, how do I deploy a network in a way that's useful? It's not just building them, but it's the people around you and the expertise. And frequently, one of the mistakes that people make constantly is they think about network only in one degree. They go, oh, well, who are the people I immediately know? Well, if you think everyone, just simple math, you go, okay, I'm connected to 100 people, everyone else is connected to 100 people. Your second degree has a much broader range of expertise around you in order to solve a problem. And yet, that's a tell for our you network thinking. Now, I think there will be multiple platforms that solve different parts of this, and it's vertical specialities and other kinds of things, and, um, and that's a partial answer to your earlier question. Well, well the Facebooks and uh, LinkedIn's and uh, Twitters and so forth, they're going to look wildly different? Are we kind of, uh, you never know, but I mean, are we, are we hitting the end of that? I think in five change? years, by five years, they'll be wildly different just because as they continue to invest and adopt uh, new technologies, mobile, everything else, I think there'll be entirely new functions and features. And what, moreover, one of the things that sometimes said is, oh, is this the end of social? And actually, I think there's, this is part of the multiple uh, networks and multiple kind of uh, problem solving. It's like one of the things that I invested in last November is this company called Edmodo, which is doing social networking for K-12, right? And it's very focused on teachers, students, and parents, and so forth. And it's an entire platform for doing that sort of thing. And so I think that there will be multiple of these networks. 
which caused this kind of problem solving and caused the platform for applications, content, and so forth to be powerful within a, within a one, one massive swath of human ecosystem. Hi. Um, my name is Peter. I'm a junior at the college, a research assistant at the Decision Science Laboratory, and I'm also interning at Zynga this summer. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, uh, my question is sort of industry specific. Um, I know, I've heard read somewhere that you're a pretty big gamer. So I was wondering what you thought of the gaming industry moving forward here. Is the free-to-play model here to stay? And are hardcore gamers going to sort of adopt that model as well? So I'm on the board of Zynga, so I have limited scope for comment. Um, but I do think the free-to-play model is here to stay. I do think that one of the things that will happen that come... Can I describe what that is for people? Oh, um, so start playing the game for free, and then the business model is actually plays out as you get into the game. You uh, buy virtual goods, uh, you participate in challenges, there's all kinds of different ways that economics could be baked into the game that starts with you're trying it for free. Now one of the things that's interesting is this model changes game production because typically game production was a lot like movie production which was you know you spend a year or two tens of millions of dollars you build the thing you market the heck out of it because you don't want to have, ma have lost a year or two and then it works or it doesn't work one of the things that Zynga has has pioneered and done very well is they build a light game and then they deploy it and if people start doing it then they build the rest of the game behind it really really fast and this kind of dy dynamic of changing the entire way the product's conceived, the way that kind of what is versioning, what is iteration, all, and how all of that works, I think is also here to stay within the gaming industry. Right up here. Jorge Masal, an MPA student here at the Kennedy School. And my question is, what advice would you have for social entrepreneurs in the education space? Advice that I have for social entrepreneurs? Yeah. OK. Um, huh. OK, two hours later. Um, so. Uh, the key thing is, uh, is education has an, uh, has, is similar to the government question is earlier, is that there are some things that are very slow moving, difficult parts, and you want to make sure that your entrepreneurial project does not bog down on them too much. And, and to just be clear that I'm not just kind of dumping on kind of how does the, you know, the, the slowness of educational institutions, the same thing is true of enterprise software. So when you're looking at, how do I get this project to work? You want to have as few variables to be in the control of, of a slow adoption process as possible. Because the more that you have, the slower it is, the harder it is to raise capital, uh, the more difficult it is to get above the, mat, the noise and do math. So think about what is kind of, like one of the models that I use frequently for entrepreneurship is you think about um, kind of, it's, you've got the Marines landing on the beach, that's your, that's your initial market entry strategy. You have the Army going across the country, that's the ballooning in turn market, and then you have the government running the country after you've established it. Three phases of an approach. It's particularly important in the educational space to make sure that you have a really good beach strategy, right? That you establish an initial beachhead that then allows you to begin to, to march into the market, and that would be one thing to focus on, but there's literally it's hours and hours in the space because it's, it's a difficult space, and, but it's good work. So, luck. Hi, over here. Hi, my name is Zuki Amasias, and I'm a graduate student at the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs. And I had a question about your work as it involves social entrepreneurship because you advise both Kiva and Endeavor. And I was just wondering what advice you think that entrepreneurs are not getting right now in that space? Um, well, part of it is. Um, well, I think the, the, again, there's tons of different things, and I, you know, it's different entrepreneurs and different advice, but one of the key things is to not get too distracted by a double bottom line approach. So uh, while you have a mission and while there's something you're trying to do, um, don't like, really focus on just being an entrepreneur. You have a mission in terms of what you're trying to do, but like, the, the principles of you know, is the business model going to work, what does early customer acquisition say, you know, how do all of those things work? And so part of the reason why Kiva, Endeavor, and also Startup America are all projects that I agreed to join the board of is because each of these things themselves is a social entrepreneurial project, but they are run with a discipline of a fuel entrepreneurial project. We run the boards the way that I run dot-com boards, you know, these sorts of things as a function of doing that. And so what it is is to not let the mission distract you from the fact that in order to be successful, you have to run with the same skill and discipline exactly as entrepreneurs do and ask, answer all the same questions, even though you're driven by this mission. Now, 
I think all great companies are also driven by mission, right? Have a, this is a change that I want to see in the world. So it's, it's, don't think of it so much as a social entrepreneurship, it's think of it as entrepreneurship where you also have a, a specific mission that you're pursuing. Thank you. Right here. Hi, Alex Kapoor. I'm a master's in public policy first year here at Kennedy. Um, I understand you have a fascination with game theory and okay. use it to potentially evaluate how people might uh, use their networks or enable their networks or even inhibit them. I'm wondering what the fascination is, uh, maybe what re research you might rely on to kind of rationalize that interest? So unfortunately, I think I, I do actually have an interest in game theory, although I wouldn't actually characterize it as fascination. Um, partially is thinking about kind of how individual dynamics go into social dynamics. I think what you probably have gotten to in this kind of classic whisper theory is I focus a lot on game dynamics. Right, and it's actually the dynamics by which games engage people is fundamental to, I think, how almost all software ultimately ends up getting designed. And so one of the questions I actually ask myself when I'm looking at an investment or product or helping with an entrepreneur is, for example, well, what do the different levels look like? Uh, what, are the, what are the race conditions look like, right? So I mentioned the one earlier in LinkedIn is, okay, one connection, two connection, three connection. That's actually a game dynamic, right, of, of doing it that way, and so I look at, a wide variety of essentially game design techniques, now, which has some relationship to game theory. Game theory has this other pure kind of eco economics, you know, uh, prisoner's dilemma and other kinds of, of questions within it, which I'm also interested in. But the game dynamics is the question that I always ask myself when I'm looking at things. All right over here. Hi, my name is Brian. I'm a freshman at the college. As an angel investor, what's your take on the crowdfunding act and just the idea that someone like my mom could invest in any company. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, I don't know your mom. <laughs> um, the, uh, so I think one of the things that's been really, really helpful for innovation is, being, is when you actually have the cost of innovation driven down a lot, e.g. Uh, creating new kinds of software products and so forth, you now allow much wider range of innovation. So having lots and lots of different projects, all the costs being driven down from open source software, from distribution techniques online and everything else, I think has been very helpful to the, you know, kind of the whole Web 2.0 and next flowering of, of the internet. Now, when you get to crowd uh, funding, there's good and there's, you know, challenge. The good is actually, in fact, having uh, a number of folks, whether it's Kickstarter or other kinds of things, although Kickstarter is not share ownership, that's one of the challenges there. Um, uh, allow for people to fund a lot of different things with small chunks of money is a good thing for creating a much broader ecosystem. You know, the challenge is, is that actually investing is somewhat of a professional activity and you, you worry about, um, and this is one of the reasons why we have restrictions on accredited investors, which I do think is, is in need of reform and I think I'm by and large very supportive of the JOBS Act, but you also want to make sure that people don't uh, think that they're investing well when they're not. Uh, generally speaking, and it's one of the reasons why we have public market regulation. And so how the iterations of the crowdfunding will work in order to hit both of those goals the right way, I, I think it's, it's that vector which is most interesting. And I think, I haven't done the analysis of the current law, but it doesn't look dangerous, but I, I could be wrong. Thanks. Say more about what you think about Kickstarter.com. It's one of those things where I think a lot of people might have said, what? <laughs> Well, so, you might describe it for people. Yeah, so Kickstarter it. basically allows uh, anyone to post a project and essentially try to raise funding for the project. And it tends to raise money largely for movies and design things. And people might finance it, uh, generally speaking, for two reasons. One, they just want to see the creation of it. And the second is sometimes the, the way these projects go is, oh, if you fund me X, like you know, one of the, the, the things that I actually bought on Kickstarter uh, through funding the project was these uh, iPhone robots, where they used iPhones as the as the command and control structure, because it has a camera for sensor and has a CPU and so forth, in order to, to drive robots around. And, um, and partially, I was very interested in the project, which was promotive, and I was also interested in the Kickstarter as a, as a function of this. And, um, but you, get, you, you don't get it, you don't, you don't get share. the company, yes. you don't have shares, it, yes. there may be a reward. Yes, exactly. And so part of what it is, is uh, people have curiosity, people have interest, and part of what Kickstarter enables is that marketplaces of putting those two things together. Because for example, even if I wasn't researching Kickstarter, I still would have made the donation and still would have gotten the two little robots because I'm curious about how robotics is gonna be changing the world in the next 10 years as well. And this was two engineers doing it themselves. This is part of the, not just the crowdsource funding, but the crowdsource 
um, uh, of, of many, many different kinds of entrepreneurs. And that's part of how the cost structures come down. Because they're like, hey, we can just use iPhones to do this with a little kind of chassis and so forth. And it's really cool. Right up here. Hi, my name is Amy Canham. I build medical electronics for the developing world at Boston University. Um, we've recently seen a really interesting um, example of viral marketing, intentional created viral marketing with the Coney 2012 campaign. Um, can you speak to what, um, or at least what are your tips for designing and implementing successful viral campaigns? Um, so let's see. One of the key things on viral campaigns is to recognize that there's a lot of noise, right? And so it's always a question of how do you get it through the initial noise set. And part of that is you have to uh, think about uh, think about epidemiology, which is how does the thing spread, right? So not only, like for example, how do I infect Dean Elwood, but how does he then go to infect other people? And what does that sequence look like in terms of the things you're building, whether it's a product or a specific campaign? And part of that, um, you know, people tend to get distracted a little bit too much with, you know, which demographics and these sorts of things. But part of that is um, uh, you actually have to have something that has some kind of incentive. It could be humor sometimes, like you see humor being viral frequently. Um, it can sometimes be uh, unusual information. It's one of the reasons why, for example, speaking about like uh, government and information and so forth, like a lot of like kind of bad facts spread because people go, oh, that seems true, but it sounds, seems outrageous and it spreads. And, you know, don't encourage people to do that, but it does spread. <laughs> Uh, and so those are the kinds of things. Uh, you also, there's also a lot of science in it, which comes down to, uh, for example, Ian, when things are forwarded, if they have too many links in them, that always uh, decreases conversion rate. Uh, there's questions about, uh, can you actually get it to genuinely to people and their friends? Uh, part of things, uh, platforms like Facebook make virality easier in some ways. Anyway, that's some subset of it. And there's, uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of expertise built up on this because people do this a bunch. And so there's not, there's, this isn't something that's easily answerable other than this high level, what I just said, but there's people who've spent years being expert in doing this sort of thing. Uh, hi. My name is Sita. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I can imagine working, and, working in the tech startup industry must be immensely exciting because it's evolving so quickly, because there are all these new innovations coming out, as, as I see really daily. Um, I guess how, as um, a leader of a tech startup company and as an investor in others, um, do you manage to you know, stay on top of the market, do you, ahead of the market? How do you manage to um, encourage an atmosphere of innovation? Well, so... Actually, uh, the central thing, which is one of the things, and I'm, this is not a plug to the book, but you use your network to gather intelligence. So one of the things, and whenever I'm sitting down with folks from Silicon Valley and other folks, nearly one of my very first questions is, what new have you seen that's interesting? Because in order to have that constant kind of radar and sonar pulse about knowing what to focus on, what happens is when you're sitting down with a bunch of folks who also are thinking about similar questions, then very quickly they say, oh, there's actually, like, there's this thing called Kickstarter. Have you seen it? It was actually founded in New York. It has this really interesting creative marketplace. Here are the dynamics of it. Oh, I'll go check that out. I'll pa and you pass that kind of intelligence along. And so part of it is, uh, it isn't you spend hours in front of the computer exhaustively researching everything. You couldn't. There is the, it's the information explosion. It's part of the reason why information age and network age. But it's the network of folks where you go, oh, this is the kind of thing that really matters. And you're asking the questions of folks in order to, to get signal from noise. Right here. And turn the microphone towards you. It's, it seems yeah. to be it seems tangled to be in odd. a funny way. Yes, there yes. you go. I'm Jules Pierre. I, I guess I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm CEO of my third startup. <laughs> and my second one had the misfortune of competing with LinkedIn. <laughs> You never Good heard idea. of it. <laughs> uh, my first one was mentioned by that first undergrad, though, about design thinking. It was continuum, so that one's done well. And my question is, as an entrepreneur, um, you talk a lot about, in the startup of you, about pivoting, change, reacting. And I want to ask you a, a more introspective question about if you could have a do-over in any of your major choices or actions you took, what would it be? Uh, the, uh, the primary do-over thing I would probably do um, is when I, um, I went from Apple to Fujitsu uh, with a list of expertise that I wanted to learn from being a product manager because my model then was much more of 
I need to have all of these different skills. And so I was literally working through a list of how do I pick up these skills, and I'll work at whatever place that I pick up those skills. And probably what I would have done is begged my way into any job at Netscape, because being central to the network was more important, and that I would learn and pick up the skills and iterate from there. And so uh, this isn't any you know, kind of disrespect to any of my you know, Fujitsu colleagues or anything else. But Netscape was the center of where the consumer internet stuff was happening. And so literally, like when I thought about it, I was like, well, I would have gone and said, look, I'll do anything. I'll work for free, because I want to work here in order to be the center where the network where this whole transformation is happening. Of course, that's, it's easy to know that it was the center then. Yeah. You didn't know it then necessarily. I mean, well, did, was I, that, did, did, I knew did something some, some part of your brain say, gee, maybe I should do this? Well, I knew something um, important was happening, but I hadn't put it together with the, cent the you know, um, because I've been iterating on building what I think network thinking is, yeah. is go move to where the network, you know, get to the, the, the core of the network. Because that's how you get serendipity, that's how you get breakout opportunity, that's how you learn things at a fast rate. And so I was like, no, no, I need to learn these skills in order to go do the startup because these VCs are going to have this checklist of having these skills, as opposed to, no, go to where the network is really dense and figure out how to get the skills while you're at the density of the network. All right, we have time for two more questions here and here. All right, hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a second year at the business school. Um, I think I'm probably going to know the answer based on what you just said, but <laughs> what advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur who's looking to sort of follow your footsteps in terms of a first job out of school? Uh, big company, small company, do your own startup, something totally different. Thanks. Uh, well, yes, uh, the first, I'll give two parts. The first part is exactly that, which is go to where the uh, central points of the networks where is in the, roughly the industry or the kinds of technology, the kind of thing that you want to be doing is. The, uh, the second part of it is invest seriously in your soft assets. Uh, invest in, uh, for example, we have uh, one of the concepts we put out in the book is an interesting person fund. So like, for example, think about how do you say, I want to talk to a new interesting person every week or every month, and how do I invest in doing that in order to be building up the set of, of, of information, skills, expertise, and people around me in order to do that? Thank you. Last question. Anna. Uh, Hello, Mr. Hoffman, again. Oh, uh, again, my name is Sam Panato. I'm an undergraduate. Um, and I have a question about um, the collaborative consumption movement um, okay. because there was a recent article in Time about collaborative consumption being one of the most important ideas of the 21st century. Um, and one of the concepts in that article was that in the future, your wealth will not be related to your amount of money, but the quality of your network and the amount of... Uh, like uh, how, how quality your reputation is within that network okay. because it will allow you to have as many goods or services as you want because it'll be uh, collaborative, yep. consumed. Um, and I just wanted to ask you with your expertise and uh, thoughts about networks that so you've obviously had a lot of thoughts about them, what you think about that in relationship to the concept of collaborative consumption? Well, so the high line is part of what I think networks do is they amplify your ability to find information and get actions done within uh, shorter time frames and potentially be much more on target. It's one of the reasons why network density for uh, amplifying entrepreneurial ecosystems is so key. So when you think about that and you say, look, the, the, the key thing is, is your reputation within a network and that that actually counts as a major part of your capabilities, uh, you know, as important or more important or you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter, as, for example, assets like money and other kinds of things. Well, that's a natural fallout from that point of view because if you think that what matters is uh, the, you know, kind of a globalized and, you know, highly competitive, you know, an increasingly competitive world is my ability to find information, my ability to take action, my ability to be on target, my ability to correct quickly, my ability to bring resources to bear, and all of that is done through your network, where your network's responsiveness to you has a lot to do with your reputation, right, then that is all critical, right, as a function of doing that. And matter of fact, you know, to harken back to the very first part, part of the reason why I, I thought that network literacy was deem was important enough to use a uh, concept like literacy is because the ability to do that will be a massive differential edge for how you're working, how you're running a career, how you're running a project as a function of it. And so uh, by and large. Sorry, the ability to do what? Uh, network literacy. Network literacy, how to uh, run a project, right? How to manage a career, uh, how to um, uh, get work done, these sorts of things, then that's uh, really critical. All right, well, so I can't let you go without saying, what cool have you seen lately? <laughs> what, you mean in technology? <laughs> yes, well, that's the right. question you ask uh, when yes. you sit down with your friends in the Silicon Valley. Well, um, you know, part of what I think is beginning to happen is I think that the open platforms uh, that 
uh, Apple was originally created and Android, in terms of a set of applications, has begun creating a set of networks uh, that are going across mobile and are focused specifically on mobile. Um, and you know, some of those have achieved some height already, which is like Instagram, which some people here may have seen already. But I think that you're going to begin to see other kinds of things, like, for example, uh, distributed workforces and other kinds of things that are coming out of that. And I think that's literally just the beginning. And I'm sure other entrepreneurs, will, which I hopefully will find, <laughs> will have much better ideas than the ones I just said. Thank you very much. Reed yeah. Hoffman. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.